Hey everyone, Ponyo here. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of After Dinner Mint. Before we begin, I highly encourage everyone watching to join us in the Artblocks Discord. A link to our Discord can be found in the description of this video. As always, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss an episode of our weekly show. And now I want to introduce our guest for this afternoon. We have artist Cooper Jameson. Hey, y'all. How's it going, Cooper? How are you doing today? Pretty good. Can't complain. Um, everything's good on my end. Cool. Well, thank you so much for joining me on After Dinner Mints. Uh, we have a lot to cover, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, maybe you can go ahead and get started by just telling me a little bit about your background. Yeah, so I guess where to begin. Um, <laughs> so currently, I have a PhD in computational and theoretical chemistry. And I'm a research scientist at the University of California, Los Angeles. Um, and I kind of got there through a circuitous path. I originally came out of school with a degree in chemistry and art. And I was working as artist an artist assistant. And that led me to a career in art conservation. And then from there, I got back into the sciences. And I kind of chose to leave the art world and enter the sciences because for two reasons, really. Um, I felt like I had this time limited opportunity to really go back to school and pursue that sort of what I see as a more closed off field to outsiders. And then I also wanted to um, go back to the sciences because I kind of have this uh, idea that a lot of the artworks I love and really appreciate, um, the artists who make those are really kind of approaching their work with this rigor and almost a sort of scientific method. So I wanted to go back to the sciences and really learn that method and see if I could bring that into my art. Um, yeah, I, I can keep rambling, I guess. But um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm curious. Actually, you mentioned you know you were an artist assistant and in art conservation. I'm curious to know like what was your experience and and how did that influence you kind of early on as as an artist down the line? Definitely. So I worked for artists throughout uh, college and all all in the Portland, Oregon area. But then right out of school, I got this amazing opportunity to work for Robert Irwin in um, his permanent installation at the Chinati Foundation. And this was an untitled work called Dawn to Dusk. And so this was a really amazing opportunity to work firsthand with this light and space artist. And um, it, for me, it, it really influenced me in how I, how I look and how I can see space. And it was just, amazing to see him in action and how decisions were made in some cases on the fly to modify um, what the project was, how it was originally written on paper and how it was designed for the past 20 years, but then how those are malleable plans and how, how once you actually get into the physical space and start playing around, it, um, how, how the artist would change that. And so that, that was really fascinating for me. And it, it, it really has influenced how I, um, just think about light and color. Um, I have a few images I could actually show from that if you're interested. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so here are just some fun photos. Um, one on the left is during the construction where actually this is one of the, the grand reveal moments when we finished stretching the scrim and we're now re removing the tape on, you know, on the left. And so here I can on this image on the left. And then at the right, this was actually uh, after the completion of the work, um, I got hired to assist in the conservation and maintaining this work. And so this was actually when there was a damage and you can see a little mark here. Um, and so, so this was just um, documenting 
what had happened to the work before cleaning it. And then uh, continuing on, you can kind of see um, how, how this would work really is we were working as a team of about seven people to stretch this scrim barrier and scrim wall um, about 295 feet in length. And so you can see it's taut and stretched on the left panel here. And then you can see we have a lot of work to uh, do. And then at the right, you can see the, the finished product. Um, so th this was truly a humbling experience. And I don't know, I, I, I look back at this, this time with great joy. That's great. And, and you know, your current work in scientific research, I'm curious to know, you know, how does that affect your work? And then also, how do you look, I mean, how does that affect maybe the way you look and, and create art? Yeah, so I work with fungi and I study molecules they make that are essential for their life. And fungi have many uses for us. Um, we might be familiar with medicines like penicillin, um, so these are molecules that fungi produce that really have changed our world and um, changed the pharmaceutical industry as well. And so I study how nature constructs these molecules and um, how these fantastic sorts of molecules that um, perhaps are beautiful and fantastic um, and so I, I really approach it from that aspect of just how beautiful nature is. And we get to see this different view of it and we get to shift our perspective from it and, uh, tr in, in an effort to try to understand it. And so I, I kind of approach art in a similar way. I love to uh, look deeply at works in an effort to try to really figure out how what's going on and how it functions. And um, I think you could say the same thing about um, my recent release through Artblocks, which is placement and all about just taking a deep look and a long look at simple phenomena. And yeah, so it's it's been a journey. Um, and I've enjoyed it along the way. Great. And, and, you know, I know you mentioned spending some time, you know, with Chinati and, and with some artists kind of early on. You know, who were, who were some artists you kind of looked up to and inspired you as, you know, as, you're, as you grew as an artist? Yeah. So I've really, um, well, my whole life I've looked at Donald Judd's work and so he has been a huge influence on um, the kind of art that I am interested in. I mean, I'm, I'm wearing a Chinati t-shirt today. Um, and so first and foremost, Donald Judd, and then I really have learned a lot from all of the artists I've worked with, like Robert Irwin, who I previously mentioned, and then also artists like Zoe Leonard, who's a photographer. She made this amazing series of photographs of the sun. These are uh, just fantastic photographs. And then also artists like Jeff Elrod, who recently had a show, This Brutal World, where he makes these digital paintings that um, sort of portray a sort of screen space, but in the physical world. And then um, other artists like Helen Pashkian, who is one of the few uh, women who was involved in the 60s in the light and space uh, movement. She makes these phenomenal lenses that just uh, blow my brain. They're, they're totally fabulous. And then I guess one last name would be uh, the LA uh, contemporary painter, Laura Owens. I, I, am, I love how she portrays space in paintings, whether it's flat or pseudo three-dimensional. She, she makes fantastic work. 
Very cool. Yeah, I'll definitely have to check out uh, some of those names that you mentioned. I think that's always great to, to learn, you know, where the inspiration comes from, at, you know, earlier in your career. And, you know, I know you spend a lot of time in the traditional art world. I'm curious to know, like, what was your introduction into the NFT and crypto space? And, like, how did you learn about art blocks? Yeah, so I was um, introduced to the crypto space, I guess, back in, that must have been 2015. My roommate in college, they were writing their thesis. They were a sociology major on crypto communities, specifically with Bitcoin. And this was um, a very interesting time because we'd spend hours talking about this stuff. And I was a total disbeliever in all of it at that time. I, I was like, this, this is crazy. But um, I still popped into those worlds occasionally and I'd check in and see what was happening. But I really didn't um, invest or purchase any cryptocurrency till more recently. That must have been last December, so like 2020 December, or 2020, 2020 December, 2021 January, around that time. And then with Art Blocks, I got, uh, I was actually just surfing around on OpenSea the day that Spectron was released. And I just had a moment when I was like, oh, people are actually making beautiful NFTs. Like this is this is amazing. And that, that series, I, I've always loved it. Um, and so I just kept checking back after Spectron really, and um, was just, um, I was excited about what art blocks was actually using the technology for and um i don't know i i see what y'all do as a way that the nft would not like the artwork is actually transformed by being an nft and a lot of people aren't really using this technology to further and modify the artwork a lot of people are just putting images on the nft and it's to me it's it's not as creative and i, I want to think about creative use cases for the technology so that was really what got me excited about our blocks oh yeah I, I completely agree and we'll definitely jump into talking about your project placement but i'm curious to see you know some of your early you know generative art pieces or, or non-generative art pieces if you have any that you created if you're able to share them with us yeah um so an early generative nft or artwork i guess that would be this series i did called bad cash and i think um i think some of the art blocks folks own some of these um so maybe some of you are familiar with this um this was a series of about a hundred works that were all made kind of related to my scientific research. So I, I run a lot of molecular dynamics simulations at work. And so here I took advantage of breaking those molecular dynamic simulations and corrupting those simulations in order to radically distort and create generative 3D geometries and 3D objects. And so it was all about this idea, can you have this sort of failure in mathematics that leads to a, an, a success in aesthetics? Um, so let me pull up, I think I might be able to share a um, few images here. And was it released that. on yeah. OpenSea or, or where was it? Where were these, uh, the this cash uh, released? Yeah, so originally I actually released them through OpenSea. But then once I learned what was happening with their contracts, I actually got a little worried. And I actually created a bridge that you could send your tokens to this bridge and you would 
mint a new ERC721 token. And so most, I think 90% of the tokens, I don't know if the other 10% are lost or what happened, but 90% of the uh, collectors have bridged their tokens. And so I, I think it was successful. Yeah, definitely. And so I'm not able to share this other screen I have, but uh, okay. if I'll you're interested, up. if you go to my website, cooperjameson.com and then go to artworks bad cash it, it should be able you should be able to view the collection okay. and see everything great and then uh do you have any uh, actually we'll just go ahead and jump into placement I'm, I'm curious so this is your first art blocks release um i'm curious to know like what was the inspiration behind this project yeah so as i mentioned um Donald Judd was a huge inspiration for this project and his work and how that has influenced my whole life. Um, and then another uh, body of work that was really inspiration for this was also Joseph Albers uh, works, the variant plans, the Adobe series. And so these were two uh, different works, um, some were paintings or printed works that uh, were really investigations about color and how we can perceive colors and really about that sort of concept. Um, and placement for me was trying to create an algorithm to extend those works and have complete control over a generative system so that each output feels like it was physically placed and put in its position and that each output feels intentional and very thought through. And so it was uh, very different from how you might think of traditional uh, generative systems where you just randomly place elements. Um, and so. It, it was uh, fun to explore it in, in a different uh, light like that. Great. Yeah, I, I think the beauty for me with placement is, you know, the simplicity of it, but then also just how well these different pieces can kind of um, sit next to each other. You know, like with a collector, I feel like a lot of them can collect and make sets. Was that intentional at all? Yeah, so I always think in relative terms or um, especially when I'm making a series of work about how they work together or how you can pair them. And some of the works are single panels um, versus others are two or three or four, et cetera. And so some of them can pair just by themselves by having multiple panels in the same frame but in other cases, it's quite fun to really construct pairs yourself. And I actually have a few uh, slides here. I can show some, some pairings that I, I thought were uh, quite fun and, and invigorating. And so, um, yeah, so here are two examples, number 83 and uh, number 310, I think. Uh, 310 on the right here is owned by Pixel Pete. I've always uh, loved this one. So uh, what, what a lovely, uh, good, good work. And um, to me, the, the pairing here is quite fun how this inventing these black and white rectangles, uh, you can see some similarities between the two pieces. And then from left to right, you see this uh, contrast in both the colors and also the orientation. So it, it, this is kind of a fun pairing and, and creates a sort of uh, rhythm from, from right to left or left to right. And, and you mentioned the feature inventing, what exactly does that represent? Yeah, so this is a sort of esoteric art history term that I thought at the time when I learned it was a totally normal term. But uh, my art history teacher, Matt Johnston, uh, he didn't tell me that it's not very, it's not used very frequently. And so, so I learned this back in 
uh, I guess like 2012, 2013. But uh, that, that word has always stuck with me. Um, and so this was a, a way that um, people talk about underdrawing and underpainting in uh, Renaissance paintings and, and also uh, plus or minus a few hundred years from that period. And so I believe it was Vermeer who was most famous for this. And so in these underdrawings, which were done with uh, Conte and charcoal, so white and black uh, colors, um, in certain cases, Vermeer would leave those strokes and you could see them through all the layers of paint. And this uh, term inventing really comes from this idea that these artists were inventing space early on in the work. And so it's, it's just uh, something you can um, kind of see that process of their creation. And so I, I just call the black and white elements that uh, inventing. Appreciate you sharing that. And then I guess um, I have a few other pairs here. And so here we have a quite simple monochrome um, print at the left here. And then at the right, it's really contrasted by this vibrant pseudo symmetrical um, mint number 284. And so we with this series, you can have these singular panels or these multi-panel works. And, and it's it's fun to see the uh, difference in these, uh, the diverse outputs that this program makes. And so I guess at the left here, one of the, the fun things about all these similar shades of gray and black is it kind of can mess with your perception of depth. Like you don't necessarily know when you first take a look at this work, whether this large black rectangle is in front of or behind this smaller black rectangle. And so it's, um, it's to me quite uh, nice to kind of trick your eyes and try to understand what, what your eyes are actually seeing. And then, so here we have a pairing between two pieces that sort of contrast each other on their own. And so from piece to piece, you can see this huge contrast between these black and yellow panels to these vibrant, bright, saturated panels. And just looking at each piece though, you can see this contrast within them. So like the, the left panel versus the right, um, it's the same unit, it's just rotated. And so that sort of thought process is um, simple, but it can create this sort of rhythm in how you see the work. And then at the right, um, so there's, three colors and then there's this black and white. And it's just fun to me to try to ask yourself whether or not this orange is the same as this orange and how, how we perceive these colors. I was actually thinking the exact same thing when I was looking at it, when you changed the slide, I was like, is that the same, you know, color of orange? But yeah, I, I love that. And I also love, you know, the, the white parts of the rectangle next to the black and how it kind of blends in with, you know, the background. I think that's a beautiful touch for that specific mint. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, there's this saying that you can ask, a hundred people what Coca-Cola red is and everyone will give you a different answer. Yeah. But it's, so it's, it's just interesting to think about associations with color and how we perceive them. And I'm curious. Um, so I know you have one of the features is modes. I'm curious to know how they're shown in a given mint. Yeah. So 
I believe that the modes are just really whether or not it is um, what what the background of the digital image is. So we have a, a light mode and a dark mode. And what this corresponds to in the physical works is when you're framing them, the color of the matting. And that's either this dark gray, this black color, or this light gray, this white color. And then with regards to, you know, color palettes, I'm curious to know how you, you go about selecting color palettes, like how you're inspired um, by color. And then do you have any, you know, personal favorite color combinations in this specific project? Yeah, so color is almost everything in this project. Um, and it took a long time and a long time of just looking over little swatches, whether you're looking at them physically or on your screen, um, and just trying to create colors that really just are cohesive and coherent. And But then you also want to kind of break that up sometimes too. And so um, it, it's a very fun process. Um, it is not a simple process either. And um, in terms of one of the color palettes though, there was one that was in honor of a really wonderful colorist and their name's Blinky Palermo. They're, they're artists I've always appreciated and um, thought was a, a really unique character. Um, they would always choose these highly saturated, bright, rich colors. And then other times they'd choose these colors that were almost cringe inducing, but the way they would pair them with the adjacent color or, or another color in the work would work flawlessly. And it was, they, they were just a fascinating uh, colorist and I've always appreciated um, how they thought through these processes. And um, yeah, so, so it, if, if you're not familiar with their work, I'd highly recommend looking them up. Blinky Palermo. And that's where the Palermo palette comes from in this series. And, and I'm curious, you know, I, I love, I feel like every artist is a little bit different how they name the actual palettes for a specific project. Like you mentioned, obviously one of the colors is named after someone specific that has, um, uh, you know, great meaning for you. How, what about the other colors and the other color palettes in this project? Are they related to, you know, people you look up to or, you know, you know, maybe things that you see on a daily basis. I'm kind of curious how you went about like the actual naming of the palettes. Yeah. So with regards to the rest of the names, they're, I guess, just thoughts that I, I think about a lot um, and simple in that regard. Like I remember home is one of the more just sky and, and these are, colors that I associate with those things. And um, hopefully they, they go well together. Great. And, and did you have any other placements that you wanted to share or, or I is that the last I might have a slide or two. Yeah, so yeah, I've, I think two more slides I can share on this. Yeah, please. Um, so here at the left, we have a, a quite simple uh, mono panel work and then compared, uh, contrasted really with this four panel work. And if you just look at this from left to right or right to left, uh, mm -hmm. you can see that we start with some color and then we quickly go into our black and white tones. And as we continue, then we uh, have this re reprieve of color at the end again. And so I, I love this uh, pairing as um, you can see this um, makes your eyes oscillate from one side to the other. And then here are three mints that I, uh, I actually own these three. I, um, and I find, I, I really love each of these for very different reasons. And you've, I've already showed you the panel on the left and in the middle. And I'm excited to share that um, these will actually 
be going to an exhibition along with a few other mints from placement. Um, and that will be in Marfa, Texas, and that will be at the, the distillery there. And this will be all through art blocks. And so I, I actually, I've shared a few of these mock-ups in the discord before, but um, um, so this is sort of how I've been envisioning the physical aspects of this work. And these would be these uh, 20 by 30, relatively speaking, silkscreen prints that, that are framed and hung on the wall. And so these would be physical um, representations of the work. And hopefully after the exhibition, I'll uh, be able to work with my printer to accommodate for anyone to ask uh, to, for me to print their uh, mints. And so hopefully that'll be up. Um, and running by mid-May or so. Okay, excellent. We'll definitely have to keep an eye on that in the in the artist announcements. I'm curious to know, um, as far as this exhibit, like how long will that be up? And will it be up through, uh, what is it, um, the Invitational? It will be up May? during the Marfa Invitational. And then um, I we haven't hammered out how much longer after that or if at all it will be up. So at least from... May 6th through the 9th. Okay. Excellent. Well, I, I want to jump into one of your other projects, which I believe you just shared recently. It's called Light Rays. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I would just love really to hear about yeah, this. about the idea behind this project. Seems very exciting. Yeah, so I love what Artblocks has been doing with on-chain art, and I want to really extend this to other artists who might not uh, know web-based code like JavaScript or H various um, suites like that. And so what I wanted to make was a framework for artists to create works that are made with Python or even Blender, like the 3D program that's open source. Um, and in order to make the works that they make with those programs or languages and host them on the blockchain. And so I've just been working, I guess, for the past 11 months kind of quietly on figuring out how to make those files uh, and put those files on the blockchain. And so if you think about uh, Blender, the program, these 3D scenes are sometimes as large as a few gigabytes. And so it's been a great challenge to try to figure out how we can compress these files and store them on the blockchain. And so the light rays is a proof of concept of that sort of technical venture. And it's also, it's an artwork that it's all about meditating on how light and the environment can change how we perceive an object. So this series of work is a hundred images of this object at different times of day or different uh, environments. And I can show a few slides on this. Yeah, please. I'm curious to know, like how do people go about purchasing a piece from this project? Yeah, so you should be able to uh, purchase this through my personal website. Um, and so here we go. And so here is just a little screenshot from my website, just cooperjameson.com. And you can just navigate to the art and then click on light rays and you'll see this uh, page here. And you can just connect your wallet and purchase once this project goes live. But in the meantime, um, you can uh, peruse the gallery. And if you're curious about it, also read the, the Frequently Asked Questions page as well. And so uh, the gallery, you can see the first five mints. Um, and so those are owned by me. And so 
the the rest the, the other 95 are are uh, free for anyone to purchase and so this essentially was just a way for people to see uh what sort of outputs this program could produce and so here is one of one of those outputs and so um, this has been a very fun project for me to really um, figure out how we can make these uh, huge and large files end up on the blockchain, but still have a beautiful end result. And so it, it's, it's been um, a joy and I'm, I'm really excited for this, this project to uh, come to fruition. Awesome. And so they just need to go to cooperjameson.com. They can cruise the gallery, ask questions, or maybe there's some frequently, frequently asked questions and uh, even make a purchase for this piece, correct? Exactly. Yeah. And so this is, uh, if you look at the contract, um, you will be able to see all the code that is used to uh, produce the work and so this, what I'm showing you here is outdated. And this was actually during the testing of the program. So if you were to run this code, you actually wouldn't produce the same images that are uh, the final result that uh, is to be released. And that's just so people um, don't try to game this system right now. But, um, and so I, I hope that structuring contracts like this um, will be adopted by uh, other 3D artists. And um, I've really made this whole project open source and CCO, hopefully so that we can uh, educate others about what limits and what we can actually do with on-chain artwork. Very cool. Yeah, definitely looking forward to seeing that come to life. And like you said, I think it's great that it's like an educational tool and proof of concept. And I think it's such a great thing what you're doing. Thank you. Are there are there any other projects you have in the works for you know sometime in twenty twenty two? There's just one thing. So I wanted to release two projects this year, Light Rays, and then this other project, Libra. Uh, but other than that, I have no plans of uh, making any any other works this year. I just want to really um, have these be quality releases and make sure they, that they are well received. So yeah, there's just one other work, Libra. Okay, excellent. And you are on the Artblocks curation board. And so I have, you know, some questions regarding that. What, first one is, you know, what does curated mean to you or to the board as a whole? Yeah, so curation is really complex. Um, this is a challenging topic, but for me, it's really just an artwork or some sort of generative content that is aesthetically pleasing. And, but that's not all of it. And so on top of that, I really want it to be uh, pushing this genre forward. And um, I don't want it to be old. I, I want to see uh, new concepts and new questions and new techniques really being pushed forward. And so for me, that's what curated means. Okay. Excellent. And then what is the, you know, the current process for the curation board to select projects? Like, are you given, um, yeah, I'm just curious to know, like, how does, what is like the flow like of actually selecting a project for curation? Yeah, so it's, it's pretty bare bones. Um, we, as a board, we, uh, I don't know, how many people necessarily vote each week, but we all are sent a uh, email and also a message in Discord about which projects we need to look at and we need to rank them, um, whether or not they should be curated or not curated. And we send uh, notes with each ranking as well. So, so we rank them on a scale of one to five and then uh, defend why we rated the project as such and also give feedback and um, critique or input of 
how how we think uh, we can make this a constructive critique as well. And so um, each week there's maybe three to 10 projects and it, it can take anywhere from 20 minutes to a few hours to go through all of them. And so you send in your critiques and sometimes you'll chat about them in the discord with the other curators. And then um, the decisions, we aren't made aware of which projects go through uh, curation successfully until it's announced. And so um, we don't, we're not involved in, in any of the later processes. Great. And then what are the main things you look for when you're, you know, let's say you get a couple projects, like what are the main things that you're looking for in a project that you consider it to be uh, curated? Is it, you know, aesthetics? Is it, you do, you do, do you look at the code at all? Or is that like even a factor? Or yeah, I'm just kind of curious, like what the, that process looks like for you. Yeah, so first and foremost, it's just what what we see. And so that's really what I initially judge the project on. Just um, what we see, the aesthetics of it, whether it, it works with me. Um, and so that's a highly subjective thing, you know, and each person on the board is going to act differently about like that. Um, and then if, if I'm drawn to the project and I, if I think it is beautiful, then I will actually look at the code a little bit and see how it's working. If, if I'm not drawn to the project, I, I don't look at the code. Um, and so it's, um, it's something that I consider only after I consider aesthetics. Uh, and then I, yeah, I'm just really looking for good colors. I want to see things that just look nice. And then I want to see um, just new uses of the technology. I want to see different forms, different, even just simple ideas. And um, I just, I just want new works to be seen. Great. And then what would you say is like the most challenging part about being on the curation board? It's, it's challenging mentally just to, I don't know, I, I, I want people to succeed and be happy and have fun creating. Um, that's really why we all do this, I hope. And it's hard to say no to people. And I always, I don't know, maybe I'm harsher than other people about whether or not a project should be curated. And so it's hard to turn people down. And so I, that that's the hard part for me. And I'm sure there's times when you think something might be curated, but then maybe other people don't agree and then ends up not being a curated project. So I'm sure that that definitely plays a factor as well. Yeah, it's, yeah. And, and how do yeah, you think, yeah, definitely. And and how do you think, you know, art blocks will influence the future of generative art? Yeah, so I feel like art blocks is already pushing NFT technology. And so people will continue playing with this sort of structure and I don't know where it's going to go, but I, I just hope that um, we see some good art along the way. And I, I'm just excited to see how we can actually use this technology to further the art and actually change that. Because to me, what we see and the artwork that we look at is the most important part. And so um, if art blocks can create beautiful works, I think that's a success on its own. And, and now I want to talk a little bit about Marfa. I, I know there's a lot of meaning for you in, in Marfa. Like, what is it about Marfa for you that makes it a special place? Well, 
There's so many reasons. Um, well, first off, uh, the landscape there is beautiful. It's um, so rare that you're in a high prairie desert where in all directions you can see a great distance and the horizon's just lower than your shoulders. It makes the sky have this wonderful impact. And every day the clouds are just stunning. And so, so just where Marfa is makes it very special on, its, on itself. Um, and then also just the caliber of people there. Everyone is not only so nice and inviting, but um, everyone works and operates at such a high level. Um, whether you're just getting food from Mark Scott and Khaki, just getting some barbecue, it's gonna be amazing. Or if you're getting just burritos from Ramona, burrito lady, um, that's gonna be fantastic too. And so it just, the, the skill level of everyone is, is really high and that's just amazing. It's, and it's not everywhere that it's like that. And then also the art, the, all the art there is uh, very nice, well thought out. The Chinati Foundation, the Judd Foundation, the Wrong Gallery, um, 2D, all of these places just, they have exquisite exhibitions. And so it's, um, it's just all in all, it's a, a beautiful community. Right. And I, I did hear about those burritos. I remember not being, unfortunately, I wasn't able to get them last time when we were there for the Art Blocks house opening. But hopefully uh, when we do have that event later this year, that's somewhere I do check out. And, and speaking of, you know, the Art Blocks house, you know, how was your experience uh, in Marfa for that actual opening? Yeah, it felt, to me, it felt very fresh. And I was um, really excited by the exhibition. And so I, I brought my dad, I brought my, uh, my mom, my brother. And then I also, like once we went and we looked at everything, um, we just ran over to our friend's house, Rob, and we were like, you gotta come see this. this. This is really fun what they're doing here. It's new, it's different. And I don't, I see there, there's a lot of potential for the Art Blocks house and um, what, what y'all can do in Marfa. So it's, it's exciting. Right. And, and what are your thoughts just that for the Art Blocks house to be in, in Marfa itself? Yeah, so it's, challenging um, because Marfa is a it, it's a very traditional uh, place for the art world and they that's really what they show is a uh, very traditional art and not many people are breaking that mold um, and so it's really refreshing uh, to see something different um, of course there's going to be pushback when when you're doing something like that though. So it's, it's challenging. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, will you be attending? So I, I know we have our event last year in October and we do plan to do, make this an annual event for you know, artists, collectors, anyone interested in, in art box. Is that something you see yourself attending again? You know, if we have it again in uh, September or October of this year? Yeah, I, I would definitely uh, love to see what, what y'all are, uh, going to show and um yeah i would definitely want to be there and, and finally like what are your favorite things to do and see when visiting marfa like if you have like a go-to list or a couple places that you're like i have to check it out like what are those spots in marfa yeah so the um the big things are i would really recommend going to go see <clears throat> Donald Judd's milled aluminum works at the Chinati Foundation, as well as the Irwin permanent installation, Untitled Dawn to Dusk. So those two exhibitions at Chinati, I would say are a must. And then you got to go to the Judd Foundation, do the block tour. That's one of the only events in Marfa that is every day, twice a day. So you should definitely be able to uh, go to the block and see all the works on view there as well. 
Um, and so those would be the art musts. And then the food, you got to go to Food Shark um, and eat, eat at the truck, get a Fatouche salad and just have a good time. Um, and if you want to get out of the city a little bit, maybe go down to the hot springs. Or if you want a shorter trip, just drive down Pinto Canyon Road a little bit and, and really uh, see the landscape. And yeah, so th those would be some essentials. Okay, great. Yeah, I'll definitely have to check off a couple of those things that I missed from, from last year. So I appreciate that. You know, I, I know you're a really busy person, obviously with work and, and working on these projects. You know, what do you do in your spare time, you know, when you aren't coding a project or, or working? Yeah, so for me, um, it is it is definitely hard to balance work and then creative practices as well. And so I really um, recently I've been taking a lot of joy in reading uh, periodicals or magazines like the Atlantic or just going and going surfing. And so that's another big thing right now. I'm on the West coast, you know, and so I've been able to, uh, go down to the beach and, uh, just take a breather that way and clear my headspace. And so, yeah, it's, I think it's essential. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and how do you prepare for, for coding a project? Do you, have some kind of ritual that you do and where it's like, got to have, you know, my coffee or my tea and then, or do you like go out and explore nature or just walk around to kind of get inspired or, or what does that look like for you? Yeah. So I really feel like my creative energy is like at a certain window of the day. And that's like between like nine and 11 AM. Um, and so usually I like to, during that time, just usually be in, in a quiet area and just being thoughtful and um, just in a nice place where I can really get some thoughts through my head without having to think about work or any of these other things that are going on. And then the other thing is um, outside of those time points um, th during the rest of the day. I, I do love to prepare myself for other creative activities by listening to really one of two artists, either Bjork or New Order. And so those oh, are nice. staples in my life musically. Yeah. Awesome. And maybe this is something that you might have just answered, kind of maybe bundled into the answer. But, you know, I, I feel like mental health is always such an important thing, especially in the NFT crypto space. Things are moving incredibly fast. Like, how do you wind down after a project is is out there? Do you, I know you mentioned, you know, surfing and reading. Is, is there anything else that you kind of do to kind of unwind and, and decompress? Um, yeah, so with the crypto space, I think the greatest tool is just to be able to close the laptop or turn it off. Um, and so for me, that's really helpful. Um, it's nice that it is digital in that sense that you really can just click a button to turn it off. And it's just a, um, sometimes it's not easy to do that, but I feel like that is a, a must every once in a while. Definitely. I completely agree. And, and how can people reach you, Cooper, if they have any questions or, you know, maybe you can mention your website again, any social media plugs? Yeah, so I do have social media accounts. I don't really use them super frequently. I'm on Twitter um, at CSJ Art. And then you can also just go to my website. It's my name, cooperjameson.com. And if, if you can't find me there, just, you can always find me on Discord too. I'm in the Art Blocks channel, just Cooper. So, um, yeah. Okay, excellent. Well, Cooper, I, I really appreciate you being on After Dinner Mints. It's been a joy to kind of hear about your background and then also your experience early on, uh, also your project placement and hearing more just about Marfa, which I think is, a, as you said, just like a, I think a really special place. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for being on, on our show.
Great. Thank you so much. It's been great to just chatting. Awesome. And for everyone out there, make sure you comment, like, and subscribe to the Artblocks YouTube channel. As always, be kind to each other, buy what you love, and we will see you all next week. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, Cooper. I appreciate it. Of course.